Good morning, church. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank uh, Skyline for hosting my family and I, my husband and our two girls. Uh, it's been so good um, just spending time here in Kota Kinabalu. And I know that today is Easter uh, and a lot of people have invited their friends over here. I have also invited two of my politician friends. Uh, Jenny Lasimbang is here, the Adun for Kapayan. And also Joanna Handy Rampas is also her first time to Skyline today. She's also here. First of all, I want to ask, uh, and I've asked for permission to keep my mask on just for safety uh, purpose. So I hope you will be okay with this. I'm used to this now because in Parliament we are also wearing masks to speak. So today I want to talk to you about, uh, of course, an Easter message. Um, and you know, when we were flying here on the aeroplane, um, I'm going to share this story later, but I am just reminded that we actually have a lot of scripture reading to do. Uh, I know we don't read enough nowadays, so today I'm going to flood you with many, many scriptures. Uh, and I, I need you to pay attention to the scriptures that we are reading together, okay? Um, and I will take you to the chapter, uh, Luke chapter 23. Follow me as I read, and every time I slow down, that means that is the part you need to pay attention to. I need you to pay attention to the characters in these scriptures and what they did. Okay? Let's read. Luke 23, verse 44 to 56. This is after Jesus was crucified on the cross. For some of you who are first time in church, you know, Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins. He was tortured on the cross. They put um, a, a thorn, a crown of thorn on his head. They nailed him. His blood flowed to forgive you and I of our sins. Okay? So this is after he was crucified. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. No sunlight. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. They went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching these things. They didn't walk away. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, he wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It's a new tomb. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed G Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in cloth, clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Stay with me, ah. Huh? Don't check your phone, okay? When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. I repeat, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, um, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, stay with me, we are going to finish already, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talk, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They got up and they went back. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Okay. Now, today, I want to compare the personalities involved in witnessing the cross and how different people responded to the cross and different people saw different things. You see, the cross is available for all of us. Today, we all read the story. But how many people actually believe that Christ conquered death, that Christ can conquer the issues and areas that are dead in your life, the dreams that are dead in your life? Okay, God can, and God wants to do it again. So I want to tell you, don't be the one-minute generation. You know, the one-minute generation is like the crowd. The first group of people, they saw the crucifixion, and when he died, they say, okay, la, just like all of us, he is dead, they walk away. Okay, today, we all want everything to be fast. And if we don't see outcome, we switch off, well, we uninstall, we check out. Just on the way here, we flew with masks. And obviously, since the lockdown, it's been a long time since our girls travel. And so, one girl sat with my husband Ram in front. Another girl sat with me at the back. Okay? We we're quite far away from each other. I had a nap. I fell asleep. 
When I woke up, I saw my daughter also, she fell asleep. Then when we got down, we were exchanging notes, conversation. The daughter who was with the father said, oh, I watched a movie. The daughter who was with me said, how do you watch movie? When I turned on, it was just advertisement. Everything I clicked was just advertisement. There was no movie. So one girl stayed long enough to watch through the advertisement. <laughs> she stayed long enough beyond that one minute and she got her movie. The other girl, impatient, one minute cannot wait, cannot skip ad on the plane. That one minute generation miss out on the movies that were available. And so today, just like that, we can be very impatient. We want to check out. If I see him dying on the cross, they say that he is God. How can God die and not live? How can God be subject to man's torture and not do anything and not fight back? How is that possible? If God has promised all these things to me, I don't see life, I see death. And so, they check out, the crowd check out, the first group of people, the one-minute generation went away. Now, let's compare to the three-day generation. And we are meant to be the three-day generation. Those who stayed long enough, tarry, long enough to see the resurrection. Okay? To tarry means to linger, to stay longer than expected or to encounter God's presence for an extended period of time. Many times, we actually don't know what is to come. We know God has spoken. I trust that God's word is true, but I don't know how He is about to bring it to fulfillment. Okay? Our job is to linger, to stay on, to tarry, and wait on God to deliver. Let's look at the first um, person who actually did something. The secret believer. That's the first person, huh? the first person who did something with the death. They all saw the same thing. They all saw the cross. The secret believer is Joseph. The book of John says Joseph was a secret believer, good and upright. He did not agree with the decision to crucify Jesus. In anticipation for the kingdom of God, he was waiting on for the kingdom of God to take place. He did not give up. He was in waiting mode. The Bible says he, in Matthew 27 verse 60, those of you who are taking notes, Joseph placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. This is a tomb that Joseph bought for himself. Okay? In today's context, it's a plot of land in Nirvana that can cost you tens of thousands. This is your future investment. Some of us invest in a permanent housing like that. Right? <laughs> it's not cheap. It's expensive. And this was a tomb. Joseph, a council member, prepared for himself. But seeing the cross, and because he was a secret believer, because of his love for God, he went and he asked boldly for permission, give me Jesus' body. And I will place my Lord's body in my tomb. It's a brand new tomb. This is a man who followed the two greatest commandments Jesus gave. Love your God with all your heart and to love your neighbour as your, yourself. And because of his love for God and his response, he didn't stop as just seeing the cross. He died, he walked away. He did something more for the Lord. He said, I'm going to give God my tomb, the one that I invested money in. I'm going to give it up for God. And because of his reaction, Joseph is mentioned in the gospel, in the resurrection story. So there is one response. He didn't stop at the cross. The second group, the women, who prepared spices and perfume. He, they anointed with spices to control the smell of a, decomposition, a decomposed body. The spices the women brought to Jesus' tomb were intended to remove the smell and honour the body of Christ. The fact that the women brought spices to anoint Jesus' dead body showed that they actually did not expect Jesus to rise from the dead. Okay? 
And they were actually doing this second time because in other parts of the Bible, it says Joseph and Nicodemus both anointed Jesus' body. But this group, women, I believe they are more thorough. They want to do a better job. And so they say the men did it, but I think we want to do it properly. So the women, women were doing it a second time in their act of devotion. These faithful followers of Jesus became the first witnesses of the empty tomb and the first to see Jesus alive again. The book of John also recorded this. Mary Magdalene stood outside the tomb crying. They have taken my Lord away and I don't know where, to have put they, where they have put him. You know, the response that we have, finding, finding God is actually an active pursuit. And sometimes you might not get the outcome that you want, but your job is to keep on searching and, and you will find. For Mary, standing outside the tomb crying is a response. It is better than the person who has walked away. Because when you stand there looking for God, you are in an active mode. You are searching, you are pursuing. Then giving up and just checking out and walking away. The third category the disciples, the two of them, they walked seven miles, the Bible say, to and fro. Remember I said they went back to Jerusalem after encountering him. Seven miles is two hours of journey by foot, just walking. How many of you can walk one way two hours, find out a new information and walk back another two hours? How many of us can do that today? These two disciples did the exact same thing. And here it says they were in conversation about what had happened. They were like-minded people. They saw the cross, but they didn't just walk away and say, I don't want to talk about it. Okay? In fact, Jesus came along and asked them, what are you talking about? They didn't say, I don't want to talk about it. You know how sometimes when we have a bitter experience, the way we check out is, I don't want to talk about it. Don't, talk, don't, don't think about it. Okay? Just no one is to mention anything about it. But these two disciples, they were in conversation. The entire two hours, they were talking about what happened. What happened on the cross? Uh? How come Jesus died? Uh? You know, how can they torture it? As long as you are still in conversation, you are in a good place. When you are in experiencing disappointment, as long as you still allow room for people to talk to you about it, healing will come. Don't check out. Don't block it out. Okay? And their hearts, the Bible said their hearts were burning within them. And when they invited Jesus to have a meal with them because evening has come, right? The truth was revealed to them. See, friends, every time you have a grey area in your life, you have an area where you have no answers. As long as you invite Christ into that situation, the truth will be revealed to you. Amen. Okay? God will not hide truth from you. But your job, your response is to talk about it, allow God to move, be with like-minded people. They were not alone, two of them. Okay, so that they can encourage one another. And when you invite, the truth will be revealed. Amen. Now, that, that's, that's the three-day generation, right? The, the people who waited long enough to experience the resurrection. Now, the second point I want to make is that three-day generation stared at death and they didn't accept it as a final nail in the coffin. You know, let your heart be anything but cold and hardened. Let your heart be anything but cold and hardened. You can have a broken heart, that's fine. Mary had a broken heart. She stood at the tomb and cried. Okay? You, the darkest thing to do is to see the cross, to see the suffering that Christ had to endure and then walk away and think that doesn't apply to me. I have no sins. I don't need his forgiveness. I don't need his blood. Okay? The disciples' heart, the condition of the disciples' heart, words were burning within them. The secret believer had a good heart. You see, the condition of these three groups of people, the three-day generation, very different. The crowd had a hardened heart. They saw, they don't believe, they walk away. You can see the same thing but your response would determine whether or not you experience the resurrection of Christ in your heart and in your life. The third point I want to make is you must be prepared. The three-day generation, they are prepared to stand alone in their pursuit of God and in obeying Him. Just because you are in the majority doesn't mean you are right. 
The crowd shouted, you know, you know, when they asked, what do we do with this man? What do we do with Jesus? The sh crowd shouted, crucify him. Just because you are found with the crowd, you are in the crowd, just because you have the same mindset with the large numbers of people, it doesn't mean you are right. You don't always have to do the same thing as others. No need to be part of the mob. You keep doing what you know is right. For the secret believer, for him is, I'll give up my tomb for Jesus' body. For the women, I'll buy spices. I will anoint the Lord's body. For the disciple, I will continue to ponder on what happened at the cross. Right? But don't check out. Don't be the one-minute generation. Turn and walk away. Don't skip at. Don't be quick to just lock out. Just because I didn't see anything. You will miss the resurrection in your life. Okay? And never succumb to peer pressure. I remember um, this example, and I will always, always remember this. The last campaign, I campaigned on preserving Taman Rimba Kiara in my area. And after we became government, I thought it was going to be easy convincing our government to, to, to stand with me in preserving Taman Rimba Kiara. But I found myself standing alone. I found myself not having others agreeing with me. But the easy thing to do would be, why go and fight all my friends? Why go and fight, you know, the power? But I cannot, because I know the right thing to do is to honour my word, what I campaign, what I promise, I must do it. And so, you know, at the expense of fighting with my friend, I had to do it. At the expense of just standing alone, you have to do it. And so sometimes, you know, in your pursuit of God, you will find yourself in lonely positions. In, in the workplace or, you know, where every time you want to make a stand for God in your family, you will find yourself just like these people, alone, but you must do the right thing. You must not bow down to pre pressure and don't follow the mob. Just because everybody says, because I had a bad experience with Sheraton Move, I'm never going to vote, vote again. And everybody say, yes, what for? Let's do this, don't come out anymore. It's very easy to do what the majority are saying. In fact, always, when the majority says something, you need to check because it's always the easier thing to do. Every time I have an easier option, I always have to stop myself and think, am I doing the right thing? Because, you know, the easier thing to do does not require me to pay a price. This three-day generation paid a price. The tomb cost them hundreds of thousands. The spices are also expensive. The disciples who walk two hours, hey, it costs something, it's very painful, you know, very tiring. Two hours there, then when I discover what I heard is true, I'm going to go back two hours on foot to tell people the story, the resurrection. When you have two options presented before you and you're about to take the easier one, check again. Because very likely the easier thing to do may not be the right thing to do. Okay? Now, the last point I want to make is this. Don't allow the size of your assignment to hinder its fulfillment. I repeat, uh, don't allow the size of the assignment to hinder the fulfillment. The secret believer, Joseph, was a prominent member of the council and he went boldly to ask for Jesus' body and together with Nicodemus, they took Jesus' body, wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. Mark 15 verse 46 says, Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. You know how difficult it is to manage a dead body on your own? You know it's very inconvenient. Why can't I be like the crowd? I'm a secret believer anyway. Nobody would know that I am a follower of Christ. Even if I were to deny Christ, nobody would know. There's no face to jaga. But Joseph, a secret believer not even the one who proclaimed, I will never deny you, I will follow you. Joseph did the more difficult and inconvenient thing. I'm going to ask for his body. I'm going to put him in my new tomb. And I'm going to roll a stone to put and protect his body. If you were Joseph and you would think of all the assignments, I have to go before my boss and ask. I have to go before the council and ask. Everybody would know that I'm a believer. But he did not allow the, the size of the assignment, how difficult the task was, to stop him from doing the right thing. The women who bought spices, Mark 16, 
Verse 2 and 3 say, Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. This is actually quite typical of people like me. I want to do something first. I announce it, but I don't think of how to do it. Then I always get scolding because my husband said, you want to do it, but you didn't think how you want to do it, how you want to achieve it. This is the same with the women. They wanted to anoint his body. Then on their way there, they asked each other, all women, hey, who will roll the stone away? <laughs> who is going to do it? And the entrance of the tomb. But when they look up, the fact that they were already on the way there, their intention is what matters to God. They didn't allow the size of the assignment, rolling the stone away, to stop them from going there to anoint his body. Okay? The two disciples walked two hours, two trips, four hours, and they were walking in the countryside, not walking on highway and proper roads. Huh? Maybe up and down the countryside is very difficult. Two hours climb, two hours going down is very, very challenging, and double that. So they didn't allow that size of the assignment to stop them from doing it. Now, I'm going to say something, and don't take it the wrong way, but this is what I feel this generation of young people are doing. We are aborting our most important assignment for convenience sake. The first assignment given to us in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, is to be fruitful and multiply. Before every great deliverance in the Bible, New Testament and Old Testament, there was a move to destroy children. We read about it in Moses' generation and in Jesus' generation. Today is the same MO. There is no need physical abortion. The devil knows exactly how to stop you from fulfilling your assignment. Just tell them how inconvenient it is to manage babies and toddlers. Every two hours you have to wake up, you go out of shape, you have to sacrifice your career, you have to spend more money. Today, kids' education is very expensive, milk powder also very expensive. You cannot travel, all your savings go into their education fund, and it disrupts your retirement plan. I can't buy that Nirvana plot of land. <laughs> I can't buy that condo with sea view. I cannot buy the big car. And, and we abort the plan to have children. Not, not because children are not good, simply because of inconvenience. It's a very subtle thing that we do. We might not verbalize it as believers. But if you feel stirred in your heart, and there may be just one or two, I don't know. But if God is stirring your heart to actually have another child, take that stirring seriously. Because the Bible says, in Psalm 127 verse 5, if I, I can have the scripture up, the word of God will not lie to us. The word of God is the truth. Despite your experience, don't you see that children are God's best gift? The fruit of the womb is his generous legacy. Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are the children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed are you parents with your quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You sweep them right off your doorstep. Children are God's gift as weapons to fight the enemy. Children are God's gift for us to fight the enemy. Which means in today's spiritual warfare context, in today, today we are fighting the devil. In today's context, the weapon that God has given to us is not in our sound system, it's not in our preaching. The weapon that God has given to us is found in your kids' church. I repeat, the weapon that God has given, the strategy that God has given for us to fight the next battle, they, the weapons are found in our children. Amen. Which means our greatest investment in church must be found in the kids' ministry. They must have the greatest technology. They must have the best Bible teacher. They must have the best volunteer and the best pastors must be found in the kids' service. And that's why for me, of all the portfolio that I could choose to speak on in Parliament, I choose the topic of children. 
It sounds like housekeeping. It sounds like nobody cares. Why bother? Because kids are not voters anyway. Why don't I speak about EPF? Wow, millions want EPF to be out. Why don't I speak about minimum wage? I'll get more votes. Why don't I speak about financial aid? That will give me more votes, more popular. But the Bible says children, children are God's weapon for us. And that's why it breaks, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to read about the violation. You know, every time I read about a child falling from a building. Yesterday you had the news again. Almost every day. Because parents cannot afford childcare and they have no one else to turn to, no family support. So they put their child at home alone. This is a real struggle. Some of us might think, you know, how can a parent do that? But there are families struggling like that. And so, you know, if you are an employer sitting here, you have resources, please give childcare allowance to your staff. If you can afford it, please give them the extra benefit. Set up a childcare in your factory. Set it up so that the poor, the people who need it have access, so that the child will not die will not be wasted away like that because that is the weapon that God has given to us to fight the battles of the next generation. And because these children are our weapon and our investment, you know, what you believe in, you will invest in. I encourage you. You may not have a, a womb to carry a child anymore. You may not be able to conceive. Some of us may be in that position. That's okay. But how can you invest in children? You can have nieces, you have nephews, you have friends' children. Why don't we spend time with them? Teaching them about the Bible. The, the Bible says, you know, don't hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. So a, a performance like that where you involve children, you are actually giving them an ability, the opp opportunity to actually serve and to learn about the cross and the resurrection. This is exactly what a church needs to do not to keep the kids away and say they are a nuisance, they are making noise. You know, we, become, we cannot even tolerate a baby's cry in church. When God says, this is your weapon, you know. Isn't it good that the next generation are found in church? They are not staying at home to watch YouTube. So don't see them as inconvenience. Treat your kids as your best, best weapon. As I end, in fact, I can invite the worship team to come. You know, many times people ask me, why you waste time doing things that will not yield result? Some of my friends, politicians, you would have read in the news, they say, even give you two more elections, you're not going to win power. Why bother? So some followers say, two more, two more elections means 10 years. I'm not going to waste another 10 years in Malaysia not seeing outcome. Let's move. Let's check out. Let's be the one-minute generation. I uninstall. I uninstall, no more opposition, no more rallies. I don't want to know anything about politics. I check out. For me, the outcome is not my, my problem. I just need to be found in a place where I'm still faithful to God, doing the right thing day and night. If it is servicing my people, let me just do it. The outcome is not our problem. But we need to have the right response. Be found in that three-day time, in that three-day period of darkness. Be found faithful. Be found waiting on the Lord. And don't focus on the size of your assignment. Don't abort it prematurely. You know, at Gethsemane, when Jesus was alone before He went to the cross, the size of the assignment did not deter Him from aborting that assignment. It's so easy to think, my flesh will be torn on that cross. When they put that crown of thorns on my head, it's going to hurt me. And I'm going to be alone. I'm going to be separated from my family. My mother would be there mourning. Christ could have checked out. Why bother with a generation who will not believe me anyway? When he was hung up there, he was alone. He did not allow the size of the assignment to deter him from fulfilling it. He was focused on something else. You know what he focused on? The Bible say, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That joy that was before him is you and me. 
when He sees you responding to the altar call, when He sees you praying in car before an important meeting, when He sees you saying that prayer in the bedroom with your child at night, that faith that you have to impart into the next generation, for that joy Christ endured, the nail on the hand, the blood that flowed, He endured it for you. So when you are tasked with a very difficult assignment, and some of you know the calling that God has placed on your life, it can be lonely, it can be painful, it can be difficult without yielding any result. I don't know by the time I'm 60, will I ever see change in Malaysia? I don't know. But I'm not going to let that stop me from aborting it. I'm not going to check out on politics. The only time I will check out on politics is when the Lord says so, that my time is up, I will go. But apart from that, even if I lose election after election, I will not check out. I will not check out. So don't walk away. Be found in waiting mode. I want to end with this personal story. Um, during sports day, my kid's sports day, my child said that she is going to run in, in a race. It's a 100 meter sprint. And as a mother, very proud, you know, ready with my camera, I'm going to capture the moment when she wins the race. When I was ready, in, in ready mode to capture the race, 100 meter. At the beginning of the race, I saw my daughter left behind, last in the race. And she had 100 meter to, to catch up and all her friends were right ahead of her. You know, as a mother, it, it was so painful to watch. It's so painful to watch your child struggling and not winning. We all like to cheer for the victor. But as a mother, to see your child not doing well and to see your child coming last and then having to endure still that race she completed the race she didn't say so far behind I walk back lah. I check out she completed the race and when I went back and I pondered and I actually wrote this on Facebook as I, to, to remind myself as I asked the Lord how do you feel God when you see me struggle how do you feel Lord when you see me not doing well in the assignment that you have given to me God says your finishing position is not important to him what matters to him is that you finish the race. Finish your race. Each one of us, finish your race. If each one of us, we finish our race in KL, in Kota Kinabalu, your generation, my generation, Pastor Philip's generation, if we finish the race given to us, Malaysia will be a different place. Don't check out on church, don't check out on your faith, don't check out on God. Don't be that one minute generation. Terry, linger for three days. Linger, linger, linger. You will see the resurrection. The 10 guys who were sent in to check on the land, only two came back with a positive report. That two saw Canaan land. That two experienced Canaan. You can be in Malaysia even if nothing changes. I believe if you have the right response, God would allow you to, to experience the resurrection, you would experience change in your personal way. God is faithful like that. He will allow you to experience the resurrection. So today, allow Him to resurrect a daydream. Stay faithful to your children. Invest in them. Spend time. Read to them. Teach them how to overcome fear. Teach them how to pray. Teach them how to stand in the gap for others. Teach them what matters to God. Teach them about God because that is our weapon to fight the next battle. Can we all stand? You know, when I was here in KK, I received news that my friend, an activist, an activist, Haris Ibrahim, he's just been diagnosed with lung cancer and given a few months to live. And despite his condition, he said this, a few of us would like to try and do something a pictorial of our struggle over the last 15 years to take this nation back for the rakyat. Even in his condition, Haris Ibrahim is thinking, what can I do to encourage others to finish that race? He may not have time, but if I can compile all the pictures and it can give you some encouragement, maybe you can last 15 years for me on my behalf. We need to have the fighting spirit like Haris Ibrahim to not check out. Do not check out. And today, some of you 
who don't know God and it's your first time in church, I just want you to know that there is a Saviour. There is a Saviour who can save you from your condition, from your situation. The title, Jesus, greatest of all time. Why greatest of all time? Because He's the only one who has conquered death. He's the only one with an empty tomb. And that's why He is the greatest of all time. Death is not an unfamiliar territory for Christians. We cannot and should not be afraid of death. Why? Because Christ has gone ahead of us, conquered it, came back and showed you that He is alive. So we don't have to be afraid going there because somebody else has paid the price and is already there. Right? Okay, so let's, let's pray. If you, do, if you don't know God and you want to accept Christ into your life, you want to be a believer, you want to give your heart to Jesus, you can say this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you that I don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Thank you that I can have eternal life. I want to believe you, Jesus. I want to walk with you, Jesus. I want to be like the rest, that three-day generation, and I want to experience your resurrection. Help me walk with you. Help me not check out on you. Help me not to give up. Help me walk this new journey with you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray and I ask. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer and you want to walk with God, Somebody else will give you the information later on. And I, I pray that all of us, all of us, will be part of the three-day generation and not the one-minute generation. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you, YB Henayo, for that amazing message on Easter Sunday. I am extremely blessed by it. I am extremely encouraged by that message. And, you know, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you prayed that prayer along uh, YB Henayo and accepting Jesus into your heart, I just want to tell you that you have made the greatest decision today. Welcome to the family. We are so, so happy that you've made that decision today. And if you have accepted Jesus into your life, there's a QR code right now on the screen. We just want to invite you to um, scan it. And we just want to get a little bit of information out of you. And importantly, we want to guide you and just give you some materials to work on in your new journey. Amen, amen. And if you ha want to know more about the church, what, what's happening, you, you want prayer requests, share some testimony, you can also do that. You can easily go to our website to share and also get in contact with us. And that's it for today. We've ended our Easter celebration. I hope you guys are so blessed because I am. And before we go, may I just speak a, a, a short benediction upon your week ahead. May the Lord keep you. May He make His face shine upon you. And may He keep His countenance upon your life. In the name of Jesus, stay safe. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.